uh, good morning. Summer is here and um, everybody's very busy out and about. Uh, I'm Juliet English. I am from, uh, from Streams and Streams is a website which uh, hopes to encourage home educators through the sharing of stories and reviews, webinars like this one, webinars on resources. Uh, we have a monthly blog and we have a monthly newsletter. So lots and lots of you get for your membership subscription, which at this current time is free. So please feel free to go and sign up for streams if you haven't already. And um, just so you can enjoy being uh, helping us build that community because it is a community that we want to build up and bring more people into. So please uh, share that with your friends. So this morning, I am very, very delighted that we are um, going to be joined by a Fabian. And Fabian, um, we've only got to know each other more recently, and I've just really enjoyed our chats because Fabian is actually a very new home educator, but it seems like she's had that mindset for a long time and just not really kind of um, put the brought that into her own personal life. So that is actually a really interesting perspective. So what I'm, I'd like to ask Fabian just to please uh, share with us a little bit about um, your own background, um, how you, you, you've written a book um, on flourishing, enabling children to flourish, or uh, it was more written for teachers, wasn't it? Originally, you are yeah, muted. There you go. Higher, yeah. higher education. Yeah. For higher education. So, so you know, you'd been thinking about what makes children flourish for a long time, and and I'd really like you to walk us through that journey, and then perhaps share a bit about how that ultimately brought you into home educating your own child. Yeah. Um. So. I guess I, I'll call myself a reform teacher. <laughs> um, that's that's what I feel I am. Um, so, and I, I was reflecting this morning on LinkedIn because I love reflecting how, yeah, I am a, I am a reform teacher, um, and I uh, I guess I I was a product of a of an education system. Uh, both obviously because I'm French and I grew up in France, first in France and then in the UK, because I also did some of my studying in the UK. And really started my career in education, you know, in my early 20s, um, teaching languages. I'm a trained language teacher, believing in the system and never questioning it and just going with what, you know, this is what we do, this is how we are trained to be teachers. Um, and then along the years, I've, you know, I've I've absolutely already noticed through teaching languages that you can't really, um, you know, the way you're being taught to teach languages in secondary schools didn't work for me because I hated it, the teaching to test and the getting the kids to repeat by heart, you know, bonjour, je m'appelle Peter, and they will all say the same thing, just didn't work for me. So already, you know, through my career, I've gone through what I think is really interesting about my career in education is, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a whole overview of teaching languages from nurseries into primaries, into secondaries, uh, further education, adult education and higher education, which is where my career has uh, sort of ended up um, the last eight years. Um, and I guess COVID precipitated a lot of the work that I'd already been doing. So um, when you, Juliet was saying, um, I've researched and written books on what makes students flourish. In 2014, I went back to Bristol University because um, I'd worked there before. And um, I just realized that the subjective level of our young people is just quite quite honestly atrocious for a lot of them uh, and they arrive at university and a lot of them crumble and fall apart and and because I had that nine-year gap I, I'm quite a curious person I was like oh what's changed and why is it that my colleagues who've stayed in the system are completely oblivious of that change but it for me it was like very much oh they just doesn't feel right um so I wrote the book um, and then I, I was like, right, okay, so the answer is individual well-being. Um, and if we can sort the students, then everything will be fine. Um, <clears throat> and back then, I didn't realize that because I was a product of the system, I had a tendency to view those, the students as um, people 
who literally need need us to do something to them um which is it seems so hilarious to me now <laughs> when i when i look at where i am in my thinking um and then i realized that actually individual well-being yes it's important for the so the analogy i use it, the word i use to describe well-being so being well um is called flourishing and is this uh, ability to tap into our innate well-being that life energy that we all have um, and the image i use the imagery i use is that we all show up in this garden called life as a specific plant tree shrub um, you know flower it, for some people it's even the soil you know like the water who are we in this garden called life how do we show up um, and from that perspective, I, I sort of you know, realized, OK, yes, it's important for the flower to take on the nutrients that we give them as, as, as a team of gardeners, but it's not enough. And so the second phase of the work and the research I did at Bristol Uni is let's try and embed well-being in the curriculum. So we took five well-being essentials, which are intrinsic motivation in the middle or autonomous motivation, and then positive relationship, sense of belonging, uh, agency and competence and in our year one curriculum so 160 students we try and embed those um, and overall the research so we were doing the research and then COVID hit so the survey shows us that the students said yes you've helped me uh, develop a sense of belonging you've helped me uh, uh, sort of develop a sense of positive relationship with my peers and a sense of agency and that was about 85 percent of the cohort said that but only 60 to 70 percent said but my intrinsic motivation and my sense of competence are still not there. And I, we, we were going to do um, more sort of work with qualitative and sort of, uh, you know, interviews with the students and, uh, and focus groups that were going to be run by other students. And with COVID, we couldn't do that. But my take was, I think part of the reason with the intrinsic motivation, the lower sort of like the 60% instead of the 80% comes from the fact that a lot of students are being told that they need to be at university. So the mainstream system is very much, you know, starts with the SATs, then the GCSEs, then the A-levels, then the Holy Grail that is university, preferably Oxford, Cambridge. Uh, if you can't do Oxford, Cambridge, then do, you know, like the, 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 Russell Group universities and then the other universities. And so what happens is a lot of students, and I saw that when I came back, they arrive at university not because they're passionate about the subject, but very much because they want a bit of paper that says, I have a degree. And so that intrinsic motivation is not there. They need that extrinsic motivation. So I then realized through that, and then COVID hit, of course, and through COVID, I was a full-time working mum. I'd always been a full-time working mum, dedicated teacher, believing in the system, who is now faced with two boys, um, one in year five, one in year seven. Um, I really felt the shift into, into secondary school anywhere as a mum, because uh, even though I was a working mum, I like to be involved in the primary school in some of the events, but in secondary school, it's very much, hey, you put your child on this cruise liner, you stand on the harbour and you wave goodbye and you're not involved. So I really felt that shift. Um, but the shock for me was COVID. Suddenly, you have to manage the French language provision of a university, but homeschool your child. And as a teacher, I was like, okay, let's have a look at this. So the thing that I discovered is very much two big things. The first one was, oh my goodness, they're asking you to do this? Like, how boring. That was my first reaction as an educator. I was like, really? Like what, you're just printing a, a copy of some exercise in a book? Can you not like, as an educator, I was like, can you just not make it a bit more fun? I mean, I can go and buy the book and do it myself. That was my first reaction. But also 
I noticed how both boys, although very different, so my two boys, Tom and Jack, are 14 and a half and, and 12 now, and they couldn't be more different in terms of uh, like our kids are all right. So the reason I use the analogy of, of the garden, you know, the flourishing, the flower, is because I really believe our kids are unique um, and they've got unique needs. So my eldest is what you could describe as academically stellar. He is absolutely good at every single subject. And the minute he puts his attention on something, he's fast and he gets it. OK, lucky him, his brother on the other side it really struggles much more. We've just had him assessed for potential dyslexic um, you know, assessment, etc. So, you know, I'm not really interested in learning academic stuff. So you can imagine when you're working full time, trying to homeschool, doing this boring stuff, but also the fact that for particularly for Tom, so Tom felt overwhelmed and he didn't know how to handle the work. So we spent a lot of time trying to teach him the time management skills and like, how do you um, deconstruct things? And, you know, so I was using the analogy of, okay, if I give you a cake, what, how would you eat it? And he's like, well, uh, I get a, a first a knife. Yeah, great. And then what? And then you cut it in little pieces and he's like, ah, oh, okay. So like, well, you're gonna do the same with your work. So I spent a lot of time teaching the boys effectively skills, but with Jack much more building him up. So the conversation I was having with Jack was like, I don't wanna do this, this is boring, I'm rubbish, I'm crap at learning. Those were the words that were coming out, like I, I am not clever. Um, it was just heartbreaking hearing him say that. So we spent two years through COVID because luckily COVID for us has been a positive experience. I recognize it's not the same for everybody. Where I helped Jack develop a more of an interest into like, oh, learning is about like what interests me, but also he, more self-esteem. But what really the most drastic change for me as an educator whilst I was homeschooling is like, oh my goodness, I think what's happening here in primary and secondary explains what happens here in higher education. So that sparked, because I'm a curious person, a real thirst for understanding. And I created a podcast and I just started talking to people. So initially, I had no intention of having a podcast on top of working you know, full time and, uh, you know, homeschooling the kids. But I just wanted to speak to people and then I started sharing. So the podcast now ha has 149 com episodes and conversations. And the way I would describe my journey is I've literally like... Um, uh, so E. Gorman, who's a neuroscientist in the States, says we are live wired. We get changed by every conversation we have um, because that's how we work as human beings. And I literally feel like I have been live wired and changed through those conversations. And those conversations led me to meeting the lovely Joe, who is here on this call. Um, and and we've had so many, so many conversations um, and has led me to all us as a family to, to make the decision to deregister Thomas, our eldest, um, and to, you know, for Tom to become a, a, you know, home educated because that's what he wanted to do. Um, Jack is now obviously requesting, he's, he's in year seven. He wanted to do year seven and to see what secondary school was like. Um, but he's coming to the end of his secondary, sort of like the, the, the first year in secondary and he keeps saying, can I be home educated? Can I be home educated? Can I, can I be home educated? And I'm doing the same as what I did with, with Tom, with Jack. So I know my heart has already made the decision but my hair doesn't quite caught up. <laughs> so what's happening is, um, I mean, the journey to, to, to home educated, educating Tom and saying yes to that hasn't been plain sailing. Uh, and I've literally had to 
break up and split up with the system. Um, so it started with me becoming, uh, you know, like taking a one year career break because I couldn't cope with it all uh, post COVID and, and I just wanted time out of my job at the university. So I'm on an unpaid one year career break. So I started with hopping off the hamster wheel off the system myself. Um, then Tom became home educated. And so we on this journey together. And, I, and although my heart knows like next step is, yes, Jack needs to come on this journey with us. I'm just going to be really authentic and honest here. My head is not quite there. <laughs> my heart is, but my head needs a little bit of catching up. Um, so I feel that possibly it'll happen in September, October. Um, but I, there's days where I go, yes, let's do it. And other days where it's like one step forward, three steps back. Um, and I'm just being gentle with, with myself until it's sort of, okay. yeah. I don't know if that. Well, I'm going to put back here just to kind of take the conversation further. So, um, you know, I'd, I'm really interested to know, you know, with you making this connection between what's going on in primary and how that impacts uh, right through to further education. You know, what is it you think that happens within the system at that young age that um, that does this, you know, what 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 causes that? Because I mean, I've been looking at some conversations about the NASA. So apparently NASA do like a test of creativity. And that's had some very interesting findings where they found how children at age five have much higher levels of creativity. And then when they test them later and, and uh, you know, I mean, they're obviously they're testing mainly children, I think, that have been in the system. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah, I've been thinking it would be very interesting actually to run sort of similar tests between across, you know, home educated children and school children. Um, so I don't want to deviate totally from from what you're saying, but you know, so what what are some of those observations? And you know, being a curious person, I'm sure you've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Yes. So I guess the the link is um, the difference. The biggest difference I sh I saw in in young people in higher education is they arrive at university um, and they are not willing to take risks. They're perfectionists. Um, they've got a massive fear of failure, um, imposter syndrome. And so for some of the students, the fear of failure is so drastic that they'll actually refuse to hand in anything. They'll procrastinate. I mean, it's a, so um, an imposter syndrome and this, what I call comparatitis. So this real need to compare themselves to others always negatively. And I think this is compounded. I mean, this is a very complex issue. I think the world they live in, like the technology is really not um, helping with that. Uh, the culture they're evolving is not helping in, in that. But I would say what I saw in secondary, in primary school and in secondary school is this, um, well, we, we, we're not teaching intrinsic motivation, it's extrinsic. So the same with university students. University students will arrive and you know it, we, we teach them French. So like French at university is like, it's your oyster. What interests mm. you and what do you love about French culture? And we say to them, you know, for your second year, prepare a, a project because third year you're going to, to uh, live in a French speaking country. And we just sort of say, go and explore. Where do you want to live? Where do you want to go? And the students, the big difference for me was they would arrive at university and they say, I don't want to go abroad because I'm scared. I'm not looking forward to it. So much more risk averse and, and scared, but also um, just not curious, no curiosity, like this real lack of curiosity and interest and the please guide me, like hold my hand and tell me what do I write next? What do I write next? What do I do next? And I saw that exactly that happen with the boys. It's like, you have to be here at this time and do this. And then next you do this and then you, you do this. And your extrinsic motivations are things like, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, trying to say to them, you know, well, you're not going to uh, 
you're not going to get this or that if you don't complete that work or um I'm just thinking about it. None of it is based any any way on actually the academic improvement of the children, really. Um, it's focusing on compliance. How do I get you to do what I want you to do? So it's actually not even looking at whether you're mastering the subject. Yes. And it sticks on the word. So extrinsic motivation starts. And I'd already noticed that as a mother. So as the boys grew up, I think we we too as uh, as as parents have this tendency to become quite competitive. So um, the the reason I didn't really get involved a lot with the an antenatal and postnatal classes is that I found it really quite irritating that women would want to compare their bumps with mine. It's like, why would you want to do that? Like. We, we Even not, before the child is born, you start with the comparisons. Yes. Well, then you would just go, oh, look, my child is crawling faster or, you know, and this sort of like wanting, almost like rushing your child to reach a milestone before they're ready. So that I'd already found out as a, as a mum, as a, as a mother. And I found that quite um, you know, challenging. But the extrinsic motivation, so the I'm a linguist. I've had to learn English the hard way. So I, I believe words are magic and words really create in our reality. I, I really believe that. But also, I don't, in like rugby, I watched the kids play rugby and their, their trainers would say good boy when they do something they like and like, you know, and bad boy or naughty, naughty boy when they do something you don't like. And it's like, you're conditioning my, my child to do what you want. That, that's not okay. Like, I, I really felt that. The please don't equate their behavior with an identity because the problem with you, whatever you put after I am, is creates it's like you know i am that i am that's it that's that's how it works so if you start saying to your child you know you are a good girl or a good boy because you're doing what i want what if that child doesn't want to do it then you know they're 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 forfeiting what they're feeling and and what feels right to them for external validation or external uh you know guidance yeah um and i really saw that at university you know like the students really um the biggest thing is you know obviously bristol university is known as the um uh, as a uh, welcoming young people from the, the the oxbridge rejects so those who can't get into oxford and cambridge tend to go to to bristol university and so you have a group of young people who are academically really really able and will come with a stars or you know like nines for their gcses but the problem is uh, an a star in one institution will look very different from an a star in another organization or school so in a private school an a star will mean you will have had someone giving you private tuition your parents might have paid for extra tuition to improve your pronunciation someone in mainstream will just have had their teachers and the disparity between that a star i am an a star pupil fine when you're in a small pond but when you start moving into a bigger pond, you see bigger fish and you start comparing yourself to those and feeling inadequate, mm. particularly because somebody else has validated you and suddenly you're not getting that validation through the marks, which is what's happening. Yeah. So loads of correlations between like what, what's happening, the, the end results, I guess at university, we are at the receiving end of a schooling system. And I could really see the, the really devastating sort of effects of, of a, a whole schooling system um, on flourishing. And I think for me, flourishing, so, so if we're not flourishing, forget it. Like if you're not well, if, 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 if you, you are not well, you can't learn because if you're in survival, it shuts your, the executive functions of your brain 
Um, and that's what you need to learn and retain information. So for me, it's flourishing first and then the rest follows. Um, um, that, sure. that, that kind of brings me into, you know, because I thought perhaps we've spoken about some of the negative things, you know, and but let's let's make it positive now. Um, and let's talk about flourishing and what have you learned about flourishing about what children need to flourish? Yes. So, um, and, and it is really exciting and positive in the sense that the, the, the journey that Tom and I have been on, phenomenal. I mean, the change in, in Thomas makes me well up. It's so beautiful. Um, it's like I've taken my son out of his cage um, and I'm watching him stretch those wings and finding those wings. Um, but I'm also getting to know my son. My goodness, I didn't know him. Um, and this is just so awesome. You know, I, I, I was a full-time working mum and my priority was work. And suddenly I'm like, oh, okay who are you because i don't think i know you so i've really noticed you know and and he's he's getting into that sort of like discovering who he is and it's an emerging emergent thing right flourishing is not a the beauty of flourishing is that it looks different uh on, on all individuals but it's also a fluctuation so we it's not static you're not you know you don't reach flourishing and that's that it's um but what he's really discovering is is this discovering this innate well-being in him and what he needs and what he wants to do so he's really tapping in his curiosity and that intrinsic motivation um so has the journey been plain sailing? Absolutely not. Um, the first month and a bit, I spent a lot of time crying my eyes out and rocking in the in the corner of my of my office. And I'm so grateful for Joe and Matt and you know, like and welcoming us in the in their fold, in the fold of the dojo in Bristol, and really making us feel like we're part of this community. Um, it's been amazing um plus the conversation of the podcast but it's you know the exciting thing about flourishing is that once you discover like you start so so for me flourishing is about first teaching our young people to discover and ourselves to discover how we show up in the world so first of all awareness okay i'm here in in this world in this garden called life and then it's very much, uh, okay, who am I? Like, well, how do I show up in this garden? What's my fragrance? Because it'll look completely different depending on um, who we are. You know, I, because I got involved with the dojo in Bristol with, with what uh, Joe and Matt are doing, I facilitate French and Spanish in the, in, on a Wednesday. And it's been amazing watching those young people and how different they are and how they all learn differently so you've got like young some of them who are fascinated by grammar and they really want to understand the, how is the language coming together so one of them said to me in French yesterday can you teach me all the French conjunctions okay that's what he wants to learn and all the others were like uh, and I'm like, yeah, I'll give you a list of that and we can go through those, okay? But, but the others, they just want to be able to speak and communicate or learn differently. And I think that's the beauty of this exercise. It's like, so flourishing is about, okay, who am I? So first of all, awareness, I am here and not on the hamster wheel. And I think that's another thing that we've been granted is a slower pace, which means that that slower pace gives you the ability to hop off the hamster wheel so you don't you're not keep going 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 and you've got that headspace to reflect ask questions see what might change then it's like how do i show up so who am i in this garden called life am i a tree a shrub a plant a flower you know the soil whatever the water um, and what does that mean and then you can consciously create you can then take actions 
um, and you can move from an intellectual understanding to so my favorite favorite proverb in the world in the whole world is from Papua New Guinea and they say anything is a rumor until it's in the muscles and for me that is the best best proverb you can have because it's like you can understand a concept intellectually but until it's in the muscles it's lived um, and it comes from a you know yes I'm, I'm living it I'm breathing it then it is, it's just that it's a concept or a, con, you know, a construct. Um, so it, to me, it's, it's utterly, you know, you were saying, Juliet, yes, you know, the system has really dark and negative sides. But there's so much untapped potential and so many positives that we can bring, you know, but it requires us to really be vulnerable, authentic, and to allow to... Um, as an adult to say I don't have the answers I don't know um I'm I'm humbled by the humbled every week and in awe by the wisdom that our children hold like just so inspired every week when I spend you know and and again like this is me gonna I'm gonna be really brutally honest and I cringe when I think about that teacher I was two years ago because before I used to think hey I'm, I'm I was a lecturer right it's in the name you lecture you stand on on the, in the front you're the sage on the stage and you fill those empty buckets oh god it just makes me cringe like how embarrassing that I used to think that and now I've made a side move I'm simply like the the guide on the side I'm just holding that space like what happens when you hold that space for the magic to unfold to you know the other image I really love is like if we the adults are the team of gardeners in for in the life of our children we're not responsible for what happens in the container so if we really think really honestly think about what's happened throughout the life of our children all we do is we give them we hold that space for them to create it starts with uh you know if we are their their biological mothers we hold the space through our womb we offer them that space for nine months for them to create we don't say to our children now grow a finger now grow a kidney you know, that happens without us. All we do is we offer that space. And then the same happens when they start, you know, they come out. So even, even like the idea of them coming, coming into this world, we, we almost um, trick ourselves into believing that we decide when they come out. But I don't know about you, but my two definitely, they, they came when they were ready. Um, and so it's like, you know, you can drink all the whatever tea they tell you to drink or, you know, pineapple or whatever. They'll come when they're ready. Um, and the same with they'll crawl, they they'll, they'll walk, they'll talk when they're ready. So why, why, why do we think that our kids know? And all that changes is this, that space needs to be bigger and bigger as they grow it's like a plant right as you when you plant a seed you have a tiny pot and then you just depot and repot and you know so the analogy the, the more and more i think about my role as a mom is like you know and as a facilitator for for any of the the thing i do with joe and matt it's like well what if i simply hold that space and so um, yeah, I provide that space, that loving, safe environment for them to, that nurturing environment for them to create. But what they create in that pot, in that space, not mine to carry, not mine to worry about. Um, and what that does, that makes me go, oh, yeah, I don't have to worry. <laughs> I don't have to carry the, the burden that sometimes it feels like we have to carry right as parents like I have to make sure that they're doing this and this and this it's like and I had a you know like on our journey of being home educators new really new to this I've had a really 
honest conversation with with my elders and I just sort of you know I was saying to him you know all of those things that you're creating in this space I can't take responsibility for them because my learning I've already done like that's for you to take responsibility um and I'll give you the support but I I can't carry that like creating in that space because I'm already creating in my own part right um and that, it's been really interesting, his response, because it's certainly like an easy way to hand over the responsibility. And, and when I sometimes when we use the word responsibility, people sort of get quite defensive. But for me, responsibility as a linguist is literally our ability to choose our response. And so what we give our children is, OK, well, you can you create in that space. So what does it look like for you? Um, and it then makes it easier to talk about flourishing for the individual as saying to the plant, you know, like I love orchids. And um, so I look after my orchids. There's one on, on the, I don't know if you can see it here on the windowsill. But the orchid also needs to take in the nutrients and the care that I'm giving it for it to, to flourish and thrive. And this is where the conversation is so much easier with the with with our young people because we can just say, well, yes, I'll I'll tender and take care of you as a plant, but you decide what what whether you really want to flourish or not, right? Also, and that's a that's a much easier conversation to to have. I do love that analogy of the plant um, and the garden. I think they it's a very uh, clear one and I just wondered if you had any particular tools um, specific things that parents could perhaps consider you know if and, and perhaps also things that to, to watch for in ourselves you know what are some of our own habits because we're also the product of our own upbringing and education um, like for, for example one of the things I've had to really watch is these little manipulations that you learn maybe from your own parents like, you know, um, you know, um, you, where you sort of say, well, you know, you know, if you, you know, well, I was going to give you a sweet, but, you know, now, now, now you're not because you've been rude or whatever, you know, those little things. And I, I just wondered if you had any sort of tools that um, that would be practical or things that people can watch for in their own uh, parenting and and how we approach our children's education. Yes. So I would say. The flourishing is also true of us. Um, so we, if we're in survival, there is no way. You know, like if you're, if you, uh, if you're running on empty, if you, if your cup is empty, you can't pour from an empty cup. Okay. So I think the biggest tip I would give parents is self care is not selfish. You know, I think in our societies we've been taught that. Um, somehow self-care equates being um like you, you can't possibly i don't know if it, i don't know what it is in our upbringing that makes us believe that self-care is somehow selfish that like um you, you you can't look after yourself perhaps because our parents say you're not the most important thing in the world i don't know um i certainly that's how i grew up with you know that's why well, I, I, th I think it's this notion of self-sacrifice that's supposed to be so noble yeah that you give yeah. yourself up and then what ends up happening is you become a martyr yeah perhaps. where you're yeah. like you know you're just feeling sorry for yourself because you never get it I, if you don't mind I, I can share an example of how this happened for me yeah. so uh you know I have seven children and we moved with seven children to England um and it was incredibly difficult coming in as home educators and not being able to find families to connect with not having community um and not having somebody that I could talk to as much you know having that kind of input that I was used to and after a few years, I was, I think I was verging on clinical depression, but, you know, not sort of really seeing anyone. I was just not in a good frame of mind. And I got to a point where I thought, you know, I really need to do something that's just for me, just that I can actually have something that, uh, um, a, a space that's therapeutic for me. And I actually ended up joining a ladies choir. And it was one of the best things I could have done because first of all, it was, it connected me with my younger self, with some of the, th the, the person I'd been before children kind of, and it sort of reminded me a bit of who I was. 
and you know it also created an instant sort of social group and I loved the stimulation of the kind of singing we were doing and the challenge of that and that woke my brain up and it ignited something and set me on a path and from that path almost everything I am today can from you know that experience so in terms of home educating the role I play in the home educating community today uh, the conference that I run every year that all came after doing that and and just reconnecting and the other thing the knock-on effect of that and I think you're probably getting to that is that my children could then model themselves on that and start doing something for themselves that really sparked for them and so they became stepped up and became you know just just started to flourish in their own interests as well so yeah it is just like uh, that's very much something that hits home for me yes at 100 percent. so it, it's and I would say if you want the most powerful tool in terms of like for flourishing as an adult is literally be kind to yourself. So the, the one one thing that is really, really the, the, the most life changing is talk to yourself as you would to a loved one. Because that inner critic that we all carry, my goodness. Um, I don't know about you, but there's no way I would say half of the things I said to myself, to my kids, my husband, anybody else. And yet we feel it's okay to say those things to ourselves. So I think that would be the my, my biggest of, you know, but it's things like make time to do like you were describing, Juliet, make time to do things that you enjoy. Um, and because we are all unique, it will look differently from different people. So, you know, I've got a really good friend who likes to do ultra marathons. I don't know about you, but no thanks, that would just put me in survival, okay? So if I compare myself to my friend, I'd think, oh my God, I'm so inadequate because I'm not doing ultra marathons. But, you know, singing might be your thing. Or for me, it's literally walks in nature. I felt like I plug in and I've discovered cold water swimming. And that is like literally been amazing. I love it. Okay. So find what, what you love, that exercise that to keep physically active is really important. So for the flourishing model, it's a flower. And then you've got the roots and the roots are our past experiences, our beliefs and our values. It then goes to a stem and the stem is your mindset. So your past experiences lead into your mindset and that leads to the growth mindset or fixed mindset by Dweck. Then your life skills, your learning skills. And then there's five healths in the flourishing model. So physical health, this is why I was saying keep physically uh, active. Then social health, so connect with others. We are mammals. We are wired to connect and belong. That sense of belonging, if we don't have it, that you were describing, Juliet, when you moved into in England, you know, if we don't have that, um, that then we, as, as mammals, we really, really struggle with that, okay? Emotional health. So validating all of our emotions they're there for a reason, okay? Not trying to hide our emotions because otherwise they'll they'll tend to, you know, if you hide something, you'll transfer it onto somebody else. That's what happens. Or somebody else will mirror that back to you. Um, so Joe will, will hear, will, will recognize what I'm about to say. My, my darkest side, like when I'm in survival, I turn into this angry monster, like really, that is just not okay. Um, and I've spent a lot of time discovering what those darker sides of me are, okay, and how I get tr triggered. And I now recognize, I feel that monster, like green eyed monster emerging. And so now I said to the boys, or I said to Jason, I just need to walk away. Like, really, don't talk to me. Let's not have a conversation right now. Because if I do, I might regret what I'm going to say. So 
But the anger, you know, like a lot of our emotions as human beings, we have a tendency to judge them, right? So it's a good emotion or a bad emotion. Well, actually, anger can be really useful because it can push you to say things that, you know, if you feel really restricted or, or constrained, you might not say. And yes, of course, you don't want it to get too, too you know, out of hand and you need to self-regulate. But they're really important emotions and so emotional health is really valid then physical health so keeping physically active and healthy and you know sleep comes into that so having a good night's sleep eating a balanced diet is really important but i would say the most important health that is the least talked about is what i call spiritual health and by spiritual health in my research, it shows up as two things in the young people and in the, the, uh, the adults I've, I've surveyed and spoken to. It's either believing or feeling that you're part of something bigger and that you've got a contribution to make, or it's your why, your sense of um, purpose, that intrinsic motivation. Why, why am I here? You know, in this garden called life, what's the point of me being here? Why am I showing up? Um, and then there's five others that are uh, cultural, cultural agility for flourishing. So curiosity, openness, flexibility, resilience, and then the language. So you can literally hear if someone is flourishing or languishing the way they speak. Because in the flourishing students, students will say you know what Fabian it's tough but you know I'm trying sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but hey you know um I, I fall I pick myself up that's what a flourishing student will say a languishing student will literally say can't do it swiftly followed by do it for me with or without a, a, a please uh, and a thank you um, and so you know, those things are, uh, you know, if you were sort of asking me for tips, I think I would say with parents, start with you. Like if we, the, the, my, my business is called Flourishing Education because I really believe that it's, it's flourishing adults and young people. You know, if I'm in survival, I will trigger the other people around me into survival. I mean, there's research that shows that uh, rats and, and mice literally change the, the, the way their brain is wired to adapt, ad, adapt to a stressed out uh, rat or mice, even if they've not experienced the stress themselves. This is how serious it is, okay? So as adults, we need to first sort of learn, you know, so awareness, slower pace, you were asking me for tips. So I would say just slower pace. Um, Two years ago, I removed one word out of my vocabulary. So I never ever use it or hardly ever use it. And that's the word busy. Because the word busy for me triggered me in a frenzy, like literally made me go, what do I do next? What's like, it just makes me, it, I don't know what it does to me physically, but so I've removed it. It doesn't mean that I don't have things to do but I'm not busy. I, I am not busy. That's not what I use. Um, and it's made me so much more productive as a result, because then I just go, okay, I have tasks to do. Which one is the most important next? Which one is going to be like, okay, what's next? What's next? And then you can say, and because I don't know about you, but obviously what happens is you then get dragged into people wanting you to do all of those things. And because I'm a giver, you just want to do them all. But it's like, then the next question is, is this making my heart sing? And is this the where my area of genius is? Because if it isn't, then say no, there's 7 billion of us. There's actually other people whose area of genius and where it makes their heart sing, they can do, right? So we often talk with Joanna because I'm I'm at best when I'm surrounded by young people. I love it. I feel so inspired when we share and when I teach languages. That's like my two areas of excellence, okay? 
I'm not sure Joanna feels as in, not it's not inspired it's just as energized I literally feel energized by the by the presence of those young people but then after that I go home and I need to go for a walk and like shake it off and be on my own okay we all different it doesn't make Joanna any less or any better than me it just makes us completely different so starting with us awareness slower pace then you know filling up our cup as much as we can so we can give to our we can pour and recognizing that sometimes well sorry my cup is empty i've got no nothing to give you is also really valid and taking time to refill that um so then we can all create and i think then that enables us to create a community and this is where i want to take my research next so the real sense of community well-being. What does it look like to create a flourishing garden where you've got flourishing adults and flourishing children? Um, and I also, because I'm, um, my background is, I'm a linguist, but I'm also interested in cultural agility. Um, I also think that the garden will look so different depending on where you look. So depending on our cultures, and that will be local cultures, but that will be also national and international cultures. So the, the, the flourishing garden in Africa will look very different than the flourishing garden in Latin America or us in the UK. One is not better than the other, it's just that that's how it is. And so how do we draw from the, the beauty of nature and like all of the best of us as human beings to create those you know flourishing environments and that's where i want to go with the research is like what are there key ingredients that we can we can sort of like share so that then people really feel inspired to to, to create their own gardens oh that, that's so helpful fabienne and we're almost out of time but just one last question if you are home educating and you feel perhaps your child is not flourishing in home education or battles with intrinsic motivation. I mean, do you do you think there's things that a parent as a parent can do to to I mean, it, uh, some of these things you've already shared would maybe come into that? Um, but I think it's it's also about helping your child to develop intrinsic motivation, even when they're not in that school setting. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's in some of what you've said already, but perhaps just specifically for a home education situation. Yes. So, I mean, obviously, it, it's very difficult. You know, one thing with the with with one of our tendencies as human beings is we like one size fits all and, and like magic wands, right? We just want somebody to come in and say, like, tell me how I do this. Um, so I would say as a parent, you know your child best. Um, and I would say, so, so the work I do is in, is in the, what we call salutogenic, in the flourishing languishing, so flourishing survival, but it's still in the well-being. It's not in the mental uh, ill health area, okay? So I would say if your child is struggling to get out of bed with teenagers, it's a little bit tricky because they like their sleep. Um, so you might mistake that as a as an issue with with uh, you know uh, mental illness, but it's sort of like literally: is your child refusing to get out of bed? Are they not really interacting? Are they not really? Um, no, I guess it's like I go back to my analogy of a flourishing plant. You know, if your plant is flourishing or not, right? Or if it needs a bit of extra care, or a little bit of extra water, or a little bit of nutrients, because for some reason it's a little bit um, flagging. OK, um, and so just have an open conversation with your children, because that child will also know what they need in terms of their um, their life force. Like, how am I empowering my life energy, life force to come through? I think that would say that. The second thing is um, that popped up for me and I think is really important is is this notion of um, so really, yeah, allowing, allowing the child to be themselves and to realize that flourishing, languishing is a, is a continuum and that some days will be tougher than others. 
um, and and that you can have a bad hair day, a bad hair week, or bad hair month, it doesn't mean that there's a problem with you. It's like empowering them to also say, today is an off day, and I don't really want to do anything, mum. And allowing them that, well, yeah, give them that space. Because actually, this is another thing that we sort of like I wanted to talk about in terms of tapping into nature as, as, a, as a good example. Nature has cycles. And it's only us humans who are in a capitalist sort of system that wants to exploit nature to the most of its ability and extract, extract. But nature tells us winter is a colder time and a time where not much is happening. That spring is a time where you bloom and everything comes out, right? And the birds start singing and it's all exciting. And so that's what I would invite people to think about. It's like, we can't constantly be on the go, go, go on that hamster wheel. We too need, need moment of rest, moment of quiet. Um, and those moments might not be at the same time. So just because you want to talk, your child might not want to talk or vice versa. So I guess I'm sorry, I haven't really given you one specific answer, but I hope that sort of helps with the nurture your your flower your plant because they're all beautiful and they're here if they're here in this garden they're worthy to be here okay yeah and so allow them to discover their worthiness why they're here in this garden and why they are here to to shine how they contribute to that diversity biodiversity the beauty of our biodiversity and I promise you, if you empower your child to do, the, do that, like I'm currently doing with Tom, my goodness, potential limitless, like be, you know, be, the, the, you, you decide, like it's limitless and it's so, so beautiful to watch and so humbling as a, as a parent. Yeah. And, and thank you, Fabian. I think that you did answer in some way um, for, to me, this thing of just understanding seasons and that actually in a way as, you know, as human beings, we go through our own seasons, maybe all in one day, or um, sometimes we might go through quite a long period of, of, you know, and things challenge us that we live in very difficult times as well. So, you know, I think it is also, you know, just your your analogies with the plants and, and the flowers and everything, I think it's, it's quite a strong one because, you know, if your plant is not doing well, you you might try and find out something, maybe something with diet or something with, uh, you know, maybe there's a physical reason um, that, that something is not. I remember years ago when I worked in a children's home, the pediatrician always used to say, you know, first determine whether there's a physical reason why something is the way it is before deciding it's psychological or got some other, you know, just make sure. And I think that's that's quite important, um, you know, just to tick those boxes. Um, I had a son who I always had to be aware of what he was eating and when, because he would get hangry. <clears throat> you know, he had, he didn't cope when he was hungry and I didn't want him to connect food with his feelings too much. So I tried to anticipate and not allow it to become a, a thing, you know, yeah. just keep, 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 kept his little tummy, you know, constantly for something in it. And then, he, you know, he would, he would be on a more even keel. So, so I think it's those sorts of things we've got to look, look at um, as parents and really just observe. And, um, but it can be difficult with some children because I think even, even as a home educator, uh, you know, some like my, my one son does not have very good intrinsic motivation. He just, you know, he waits till until something, there's a stick to beat him with or something. And then he's quickly like, okay, now I need to do the work. Um, and I, I have attributed to that to some extent to some sort of emotional immaturity, perhaps that not, not learning that you sometimes have to put aside what you want to do and do what you have to do, those kinds of things. So I think there's, there is that kind of, Perhaps understanding that you know emotionally, where they mark the maturity may not be quite the same as your other child, and that comparison, yes, you've got to avoid that comparison. 
one thing, if I may. So two things. First of all, uh, Thich Nhat Han used to say, um, uh, if if you if a salad is not growing properly, you don't solely blame the salad. Um, and I think that's such a beautiful, again, sort of like saying, because the environment is really, mm. is the environment conducive, conducive to your salad growing. So that's the, the one thing. Yeah. The other thing is um, the prefrontal cortex of a, any child is not fully developed. We know that with new, neuroscience is not fully developed until they're 25. So we now call t- like young people up to the age of 25 as teenagers, they're still teenagers. And within that development, there's still so many degrees and differences. So my two, the reason I'm not really that keen to remedicate Jack, I'm going to be really honest, is that his intrinsic motivation zilled for for what I would call academic work. Give him a, a PS5, my goodness, like I don't need to do to intrinsically motivate him. He's like, I'm there and I can spend hours and hours on this, okay? Um, and obviously Peter Gray would say, well, leave them and um, they'll be okay and they'll go through that stage. I'm not sure I'm brave enough and, <laughs> for, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm still, I'm a reformed educator. I'm not sure I'm like that reformed yet. You have to hold space, Fabian, <laughs> hold the yes. space. Yes. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so so it, it but I, I guess I'm a prime example of acknowledging what's going on and what's true for us. Um, because the other final thoughts, I guess, is that life is a mirror, and the beauty of the mirror is it reflects the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's a really beautiful way to also look at is this mine to carry? Or is it my child? And, you know, why do we want our young people to be intrinsically motivated? Why? I mean, like, if we really, really ask ourselves the question, what is driving us for, like, we want them to uh, absolutely learn for sure, or do this or do that. And I st- I've started asking myself the questions with, with Jack. Why am I bothered that he's sat in front of this screen? And then I unearth all those things. Well, he's going to become a bum. He'll, he'll do nothing with his life. Um, the screens are not good for you. And I unearth all of those. And then I can, I can then challenge and go, is that true? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. And what's been really interesting in, and correlates with what Peter Gray has said is that actually our children in the same way that they decided when they came out and they decided when they walk, they also get to a stage where like, I'm done with that. Mm. I'll do, go and explore that. And maybe we just need to be us to re- less risk averse, right? And just allow them to make their mistakes. Yeah. And I think, yeah, and, and help. Them. I did find what I do find is that children do love to feel productive and to be part of, you know, creating. And I think if you can find the thing that really, where they feel productive, because I think the problem with gaming is that it can make you feel productive, but there's no product. It's all on this, you know, it's all virtual. So it's not like you're not really earning those coins and, you know, it's not real. And I think that that sometimes the games can fulfill that need and then they don't bring it into the real world. And I think that is sometimes a worry. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I think that it's for them to to make sure they're still grounded in the real world, I think is is the thing. But we are, are now well over our time. So I am going to wrap that up. Fabian, um, it's been really, really wonderful to have you uh, here this morning. I've so enjoyed that con- this conversation. And I think it's been extremely you know, illuminating and helpful because as parents, we can sometimes get stuck and just need an inspiring conversation to just re-energize and uh, help us step out boldly again. So I just want to say thank you. You've got some thanks coming in the comments and everything. And I, hopefully we've answered everybody's questions. If not, we'll have to do this another time. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, We will make the recording available uh, later for anyone who wants to come back and watch it again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. A pleasure to meet you all.